uh, is good because that's really kind of the way that we work well together. Um, she's she's the dreamer and I'm the logistics person, and it, it's really cool. So I like that um, this is still up here and it's got question marks on whether or not we can do some of this. And the stuff here with the question mark is right in our wheelhouse and the kind of stuff that we do really well. So. Um, basic microbiology, identifying organisms, enumerating organisms, totally within our wheelhouse, which, you know, I mean, and somewhat on, on Kevin's question of, is the microbiology really what's going on? Um, it may not be, but where this is a microbiology capstone, we're going to force you into looking at some of the microbiology. Um, there's, no, there's no way around that, because otherwise, it's not really a microbiology class. So. Um, with that being said, really quick, we brought these up last year as well, and I know specifically that we looked for lactobacilli in the compost, and it was difficult. I'm not trying to discourage you from that, um, but you may want to look for alternatives because, like, the MRS BRB or BPB media that we have that I grew the, um, the probiotic on was just left over from us trying to look for lactobacilli last year, and it grew the lactobacillus in the probiotic really nice. But it was it was hard to pull out of the compost, even at super duper ultra vomit smell stage. What, are, are we some, like, I know they cost a little bit of money, but like some next gen methods for sequencing Yes, we are opposed to that. Okay. Because a little bit of money in a research lab is well more than your whole budget in our lab. Okay. So let's talk about what we can do. And then some of the what we can do. You cannot do pyro sequencing. Yeah, but if you want to do anything else, you know, so if you're going to have six test piles and you're like, I'm going to pyro it, oh, but first I'm going to fundraise to pay for these other four piles, and then I'll do nothing else and call it a project. And I'll have zero time points. Um, so, so again, you know, it's, it's going to be a little unfortunate for those of you guys that, that do work in, in funded labs, because when we say funding, it is not what you consider funding. Um, it's, it's funny, like I'm actually legitimately funded now for my work and because I've been in this lab for so long, I have a hard time spending money. Um, I had to spend a bunch of BWR money this week and it made me very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Um, okay, so I have a list of, of what we have. So let's talk about just our basic lab resources. Um, so that as you guys are wrapping your heads around what you can do or what we can sustain, um, you have idea of the lab that you're working in. Okay, so basic microbiology. Um, you can pretty much do anything you want to do here. We can make media in mass. We've got tons of space, um, and so this is where. In both projects, for sure, you'll spend at least a fair bit of time is doing standard microbiology. Um, so media, um, both standard and custom, not a problem for us. So um, we can order what we need. We've got a ton of stuff in the prep room, and we've got tons of basic media components in the prep room so that if you say, boy, you know, this would be really good if it just was liquid instead of solid. And, and we've done that before, that instead of a sim media, we make an SI broth so that we get all the effects. But we can have it, you know, like I was doing bacteriophage, something, something with it, I forget. Um, but we can do that. Or like last year, we made this MRS, but we wanted a pH indicator. And so we went through pH indicators. Or Amy um, couldn't see their nitrogen fixers, their zotobacter was, um, it was a zotobacter that you were looking at, or just nitrogen fixers, we never actually characterized it, was a mess because it's white on white and so we made like a big rainbow series of media and they were able to test them in purple? Orange, orange is what they ended up going with. Uh, right, because we're still using orange plates downstairs with no explanation as to why they're orange. Um, but it works really nice and so that's the kind of thing that we can do, that on the fly you can troubleshoot and and this isn't a, a problem. Um, so enumeration, possible with this, and differentiation. Based on the kind of media that we can make. 
Um, and with that, we can do this in mass because you guys can use the plate for if somebody's there to help you use it. Um, we won't just let you have it the plate pour, because if that breaks, then 6,000 plates by hand in the semester is brutal. So. Um, but we can. So you know, I know last year, once they sorted out orange, we made 300 or 400 plates or something, so many that they had enough left over that, that we spilled them into micro. Um, so we are set up for high throughput, which is nice. OK, so we can do some basic molecular biology as well. And when I say basic, I mean very basic. Um, we are very much limited to PCR. Um, if you wanted or needed for whatever reason to do a little bit of cloning, we could do that. But those of you guys that have done that know that in a six-week project, it's not going to happen. It might. Ray Soto made two happen in six weeks and then spent two years trying to get the third. You know, so um, if it needs to, it can. I would discourage it heavily if you want to have any results coming out on the back end. Um, but last year, we purposely built PCR into both projects just because not everybody's done it at this point in their career. And it's something that we feel like everybody should have done, um, including designing primers and things like that. Like, so all of PCR, not where you show up in a lab and they're like, here's your stuff with that in there. We'll run it. You run a gel. You know, we want you to design a PCR protocol. So we built that in. Um, I would recommend it again. We might even just force it on you again. Um, so if, if you're doing that, you can think about what you might want to look for. Um, and you know, I'm pretty happy with whatever we're going to do there, whether it be for um, identification or possibly um, if you're not intending to do a lot of sequencing for um, characterization. We could do that as well. Or if you've got a couple targets that we could characterize as well. OK, um, the other resource that we have, which is often overlooked until you find yourself in a lab, is space. I know I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel here. Um, so we have space for sure. Um, that includes both lab space. Um, so you guys have been in the lab, you've seen the benches, you know that you can do 100 plates at once if you want to and then get them in the incubator. Um, you guys have a dedicated incubator, or will once we get it moved. Um, the ones in the teaching labs that you're familiar with, those monsters, we'll have one of those. Um, it'll be at 37. Um, you'll have a dedicated fridge, um, which is a full-size fridge um, without a freezer on it, so kind of like we have in the teaching lab. Um, and you still have the walk-in that you guys have been using with that shelf. But you are limited, both groups, to that shelf because we have, I think, three other classes that we're dumping stuff in there for this semester. But um, it is a lot of space. So that if you do want to make 300 plates, you can store 300 plates and, um, and have at them. Um, OK, so really quickly, um, just to go through other basic lab equipment that we do have. Um, for those of you guys that are trying to think about what we have. So again, we have a thermal cycler so that we can do PCR in our lab, but we don't have to go mooch space for someone else. Uh, we, that PCR, that one Wait, what's that? Cycler, yeah, yeah. So the thermal cycler is the equipment that you use to do PCR. Um, but if you wanted to do digest or something like that, I also use the thermal cycler for that a lot because sometimes it's hard to find a 14 degree Celsius incubator if you're doing ligations, um, you know, kind of thing. But I think based on both our projects, it's going to be hard to do a lot of standard molecular cloning stuff and, and make it really sensible, um, especially trying to help our community partners. So we've got a couple microfuges. Um, I also have a bench top in the lab that we can do 15 and 50 mil centrifuge tubes in, which I don't think we actually even had last year. So if you guys, you know, say are floating the compost and want to spin the particulates out and then measure the whatever, if you want to do that, we can. Um, if you need a big 
floor centrifuge, we can get access to that, but we don't have them on hand, so we'll be waiting in line, or when we use it, we drive over to molecular. Um, but I don't know that we would do anything that large, but it does exist if it needs to. Um, we can do anaerobic. Ugh, I can spell it right. As far as classical microbiology, we have only the Yeah. Um, if you do want to do anaerobic incubation, um, just know that it, it's expensive. Or, well, more expensive than normal. It's not like pyrosequencing expensive. Um, but this is an expense that you will have to account for because you have to use three anaerobic packs every time that you do an incubation, and um, they're surprisingly not cheap. You know, I think we pay something like $100 for a pack of 10 or something. So you, you're paying like 30 bucks a pop to grow your plate. So if you're saying, well, maybe the lactobacilli will grow better if we grow them anaerobically, and that's totally the kind of thing that we'd like you to flush out, but that also is going to play very heavily into your budget if for six weeks, three days a week, you're doing anaerobic incubations. It's going to cut out some of what you can do. Um, go ahead. Sure. So, but yeah, no. So the the issue that we might have there, though, is um, you know it's it's going to be harder to quantify with standard PCR um, if we're just looking for a gene, um, and we know that the lactose are there. You know, our concern is how many of them are there at, at different places, oh, right? Sure. You know, so we can we can demonstrate presence, but not amount with standard PCR because we, we talked about it last year too like well what if we just show that they're but we know they're there um, and even when we switch and it's better like they die and we still might be able to pull DNA you know so if, if we could have a good quantifiable with normal PCR being our limit you know totally you know and it, it would be a good way to go but again that's a limitation because we can't do any protein work or anything like that we just don't have the equipment so we can't you know, say run a Western on some lactobacilli thing, and you get you know the big awesome band that that shows how much is there. Yeah. But I mean, that being said, you know, if you guys can find something unique that maybe or be creative, because yeah. Yeah, and, and by all means, dive, dive into the research and find something. Um, I'm, I am all for using all of this as much as we can, but, you know, like, do remember what we have to try to demonstrate as, as you're doing it. And that we're limited, that you're like, oh, man, if I can do this, and then I, you know, express it in this thing, and then we can, you know, <laughs> this is not going to happen. <laughs> you know, like, what you would do in a normal lab might not necessarily be the way that we can follow up. Um, okay, so we do have a digital pH meter, um, which will matter if you're running pH. Um, like Rachel said, we bought solar fans yesterday, um, and um, I'll actually do the work on this to get them in the PVC and perforated and stuff like that. So we'll also have perforated PVC. Um, with some sort of end cap on it so that we have to pull through the pile to get it. And the other thing that's really awesome that, again, you overlook is that we have our dedicated autoclave. You do not, outside of knowing that in the prep room they do have work to do, and if they're making media, you might have to wait in line. They are here at 7, so you don't have to wait in line for the autoclave, um, either to make media or to do decon. So basically, you can make a plan and run with it. Um, unless, for whatever reason, Zach happens to be here crazy early in the morning sometimes. Um, okay, that's it. Other things, should we need them? Um, but, you know, and then all your basic lab stuff, right? Like, you guys know we have loops and needles and, and stuff like that. But um, this, is, this is pretty well the limitation. We do have, if you do PCR, a transilluminator, so we, we can use UV box there and things like that, but it's, it's really pretty basic. Um, it's all contained within a room that's probably about this big from the table to, <laughs> to there. So um, 
but for a teaching lab to, to have this and do research is pretty awesome. So let's talk um, a little bit about limitations and then I'll note some of the outside services that we can use or, or do plan to use. Okay, limitations. Two big ones. One, cost. Two, time. If you've ever tried to do anything in a lab in six weeks, you know it's difficult. Um, especially knowing that some of the things you guys are going to have to culture are 48 hour growers. Um, it, it shortens you to two to three if you're really good about it incubations a week instead of the standard five that you would think if you're just using E. coli for everything. Um, so time is, is something that you'll want to take into account. So as you're dreaming, dream big, but say, is this something that even with some luck we can have done in six weeks? And so, um, you know, again, this is where you might get lucky and you might be able to clone something in six weeks if you're trying to clone, but it's unlikely. Um, so, you know, if we're looking at multiple things with, within a project. You know, have a couple that seem sensible and then dream big on the third and say, well, well, crap, it didn't work, but I got to do the technique and it was cool and now it's in my toolbox, which is something that we want to have you guys take away, which is why we're going to force PCR on you. We're going to force a PLFA on you so that we can add to our molecular toolboxes. Um, okay, um, cost, like Rachel said, you guys have roughly $1,200 for your project, and that is for everything. That is to buy your Petri dishes, that is to buy your media, your Epi tubes, your Falcon tubes, 1200 bucks. Doesn't buy a lot. Now, again, we have a lot of stuff on hand, so some of the media costs, we're gonna be able to buffer it through what we usually have. Um, but it does mean that, again, if you're looking and saying, oh, hey, we could just do some next gen and pyro, which is what I always use as the example, because it would be awesome to do it, and I would love to do it, but it's just not feasible with what we can do. Um, or if you say, we're gonna take all of this and we're gonna sequence all of this and we're gonna RNA everything, even with our sequencing facility, you know, once we run through all the PCR reagent to amplify it and know that we've got it, and then we send it in, at even four bucks a shot, it adds up pretty quick. Or last year, we wanted to do a ton of PLFAs, and we were gonna have all this community analyses on the acres, and we got to the end and we were like, oh, crap. $25 a pop adds up fast, especially after we'd already tried anaerobic incubation and had all this media and, I, you know, I mean, just things that we had to buy. We had to buy, like, the Rubbermaid dishes that we held the compost in and that stuff all costs money. So start to finish, you got, like, 1200 bucks to work with. And if you don't know um, what we're paying for things, go to Fisher or go to VWR and look and see what it costs for Petri dishes and Falcon tubes and the stuff that you will burn through like crazy. And, and you'll see where a lot of your budget goes. So this is, this is not a hard number, but it's, it's where we kind of want you guys to plan. And we're not asking you in your proposal to write up a budget or anything, but as you're thinking about methods, it's important to know what they're gonna run you. Um, so with that being said, there are some outside services um, that we're gonna use other labs at the university here so that we can get some very meaningful data but that we by no means have the equipment or expertise to do. So the first one is we're going to have um, Jay Norton's lab, Leanne Norton will do it. They're going to run C to N ratios for us. So if you're on acres, we're going to cover C to N ratios. These come at, and it might have gone up from last year, $7 a pop. So as you're thinking about where we should sample this, front end, middle, back end, where in the piles and stuff like that, seven bucks a shot. But it's important, we should do it. You know, and so if you're gonna have six test piles, that means every time point or every depth that you wanna do is now $42 a shot. And that starts to add up. Okay, um, we're gonna have Pete Stahl in his lab do PLFA analyses. analyses. Um, so this is phospholipid fatty acids. So this is a microbial community analysis, similar to what we might get out of an next gen, except for rather than hundreds of dollars a shot, it's 25 bucks a pop. But 
25 bucks a pop, six test piles, $150 a time point. Again, it adds up. Or yeah, it's 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 cool. So it's it's not as precise. Like so, what you get in terms of your report is is very much so not as nice as next gen. Um, but you can distinguish communities, you know, so that you'll say, oh, hey, this is probably one of these three things here, you know. Or if we're specifically looking for Lactobacillus or Acetobacter or Actinomyces, we know what their phospholipids are, their fatty acids that make up their phospholipids, and so then we can look for those proportions and see them change over time. Um, and prior to you guys getting that data back, I've got a bunch from the mine stuff that I've done that we can look at, and you can see really cool shifts. So we've got last year's stuff that we can see really cool shifts in. Um, yeah, Rachel will by no means leave you hanging on that. Um, so, but these are 25 bucks a pop. Um, and this is the kind of thing that last year we did with both groups. We made sure that Acres and our Laramie Gardens did it. So regardless what side you're on, um, we're probably going to do some sort of PLFA. In, and, and again, we don't really know yet what we're going to do for the downtown clinic. We're kind of hoping that you guys have a direction that you really care about and really want to go. Um, and if you're like way out in the nebulous on this and, and you don't know, I can talk about some of the ideas that I have of where we can go with that at, at the end here if you feel like it'll help. Um, but I'd like to build, C to N we can't really build into that, um, but the PLFAs I'd like to build into both so that both sets of projects have a bunch of data to sift through and organize and it forces you to learn and work in Excel a little bit more um, and things that, again, you need in your toolbox to be effective in the lab. All right, the other thing we have is sequencing. Um, and with this, I'm gonna say primer-based, um, because sequencing anymore can mean a lot of things. Um, but this is our NAEF. We're happy to use it in-house. Um, and these are, they're cheaper now. They're four bucks a pop, right? So not too bad each, but remember to get to the point where we can send something off for primer sequencing, we need to design and order primers. And primers are I don't know, something like $15 a piece, maybe, once once you calculate in shipping. They're like six bucks, and then you pay like $22 shipping. Yeah, right. <laughs> Stupid. Um, so, but you got to do that, and then you got to be able to run PCR. Um, and even though it's much cheaper than it used to be, it's not cheap. You know, so if you're going to buy a, a kit of PCR reagent, you're probably looking somewhere between $100 or $200, depending on what kind of specificity you want. Um, so we look at that and we're like, hey, four bucks, let's just throw a lot of stuff at them. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get there. And it needs to work well. So don't plan your whole project on sequencing because then you get down there and you're not getting bands amplifying. And then you get to the end and you're like, we've got nothing. PCR sucks. I, I'm bad at PCR. <laughs> that is my conclusion. <laughs> the teaching lab thermal cycler doesn't work. Unfortunately, um, we, we don't have to use Franklin anymore. We have a better one. Franklin died. Um, his, his shell of a corpse is still there. Though. I want to see Franklin, who... Um, killed the thermal cycler? Yeah, well, I bought it off eBay for like $40. <laughs> but, but what it did is it let our lab for three years have a thermal cycler. So mock all you want. Franklin was a beast, and we did a lot of cloning and a lot of good work. Because again, our lab was never a research lab. We aren't set up that way. So the fact that we can do this is because Rachel and I have like made inroads for all of these things and done it ourselves. And so 40 of my dollars got this thermal cycler that we got three years of really good work out of, and then. Um, we got another one donated, and then I think it was like when you've got that old cat and you bring in the kitten, and it's just like, well, I give up kind of thing, and I, I think that's what happened. It was two days later, done. New thermal cycler locked in, and Franklin died. Um, so, but anyway, we have a better one that, that does work well, um, but we can do some sequencing. And again, this is the kind of thing that if it makes sense for both groups, if we're going to have you guys do PCR for both groups, 
I'd like to at least send off something that we get for sequencing so that you can get the sequences back, go in, dump them into GenBank, analyze what you've got. And it's really cool, and it's, it's a very usable skill. So these are outside services that we have. Um, probably, you know, each, each, I mean, Anchors, it makes more sense, you know, where to plan in your PLFAs, but if you're on the downtown clinic, we're probably going to try to at least have a couple or three in there, depending on what we end up having be our variables on a PLFA so that you've got things to compare and analyze, or, you know, we might just have two, but we'll have a starting and, a, and an ending point. So you guys can see I'm already spending large portions of your budget for you. Um, and then each group we'd like to have you um, identify a target for PCR, if, if not multiples, again, if it makes sense for your project, you know, do it as you want, um, and then we'll, we'll try to sequence those targets if we can um, so that you get that data back. So um, that is kind of our lab in a nutshell. Yeah. Sure. Um, with stuff. with the caveat that we might have to pay for it. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's not often that they're like, yeah, come use our ribo typer. It'll be great. I'm sure you're fine. <laughs> that stuff's not expensive. But yes, um, you know, so last year, like, Bo was in our class and had done um, some work with, with sediment and was able to borrow, and we didn't end up using it, but this, like, massive core because he worked in this lab and, and they had the expertise. You know, or um, I think we actually came across the C to N's because somebody had worked with, with Liam before, and so we were able to have them do that work for us. But again, it's, it's at a cost. And they're a lab that, that does it for everybody at a cost, and Pete's the same, the PLFAs. Um, you know, so, but we might find somebody that's like, oh, yeah, hey, you know, come, come use our gel doc or, or whatever, or, you know, we can help you express that protein. But again, like, in six weeks, it's really hard yeah. to get that done. Um, so, so short answer, yes, but do know that it it might cost money to do that, or that we might have to buy all the reagents and supplies and things like that to then use the equipment. Um, and you'll find in ordering that sometimes you can only buy a pack of a thousand. Right. And, so, and that we're you know very planned about our requests and not just w well. Artists, and being know. on the other side of that, yeah. quite often, right. um, if you guys are going to approach other faculty, um, do it through Rachel or I, so that we can reach out to them. It is very annoying um, when other classes are doing research projects, and then I get 15 emails with 15 requests from students, and some of them are very nice and polite, and others are like. I need pseudomonas aeruginosa, so let me know when I can pick it up. Yeah. <laughs> we are, yeah. I mean, one thing we are is the, the center for yeah, classical microbiology, yeah. so any strain that anybody needs. And it, it is like that. It is. It's terrible. <laughs> um, so, like, I've, no, no, and, and so this is a courtesy thing, right? So I've taken a hard stance with other classes that we won't do anything if it's not organized and generated by the instructor, so we want to be doing the same. So now you might, you might know somebody, so say you work in a lab, and you might pop in and say, hey, if we're doing this project, is it possible that, that this is the kind of thing that could be had? You know, that, that if you have this relationship with somebody, you know, I mean, like Josh works in a lab. If he's going to go talk to Christina and say, hey, would it be an issue if we did this thing here? Oh, it would be, okay. Or if not, then he can go through us and we can generate and then make sure that that way if somebody needs to get paid, they get paid and stuff like that, and, and that we're doing it in a courteous fashion. Um, yeah, so that's that is the caveat there as well. Like, so we're we're often on the flip side of that coin. Other questions? Sorry, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so um, the, the downtown clinic thing is really on my mind about yeah. uh, like a testable experimental plan for the lab. And I uh, I don't know. I, I I sat quite a while yesterday kind of pondering this, and I I really think that our so like if you really wanted to get down to dirty, if this would be like testing. Right. I mean, that would be, honestly, that would be a, a wonderful, wonderful way to figure out the effects of something like this. But I don't think we're going to get access to poor people's poop, and I don't think over the period of this semester that's what we're going to, I don't think that's I what we're going to do. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. So, so with, with that being said, we, we work with poop a lot in our lab. 
we go to the sewage treatment plant all the time. I know many of them on a first name basis. But I, I, I don't and know what's really interesting. Yeah, but it, it doesn't distinguish like who would have and who wouldn't need it. But it does give us natural samples. Sure, sure. That you don't need to fill out any IRBs or anything like that for. There is no ethical dilemma with going and getting sewage. Do you want me to talk about the projects? Because that's kind of what. I'm going to start that one. Yeah. And, and, and as the group, we did get there, and you guys will notice on some of the, as we, there weren't a lot of hypotheses out there. But um, actually, Sean wrote a specific aim that, that came dang close to being a good textual hypothesis. Um, I think we were starting to get there. Kevin has one that I think with rephrasing is, is getting there. Uh, and it gets. Um, it starts to head that direction. So I think we are there, John. Okay. I, I, I actually believe they've done, it's, it's just uh, as a group, I think we're there. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's fine. And so, we, we, we're making some journey. so when, when we do this, we want you guys to have ownership of the project. And so with that being said, even though we're going to kind of ballpark how Rachel and I have wrapped our heads around these projects, that does not mean that that is what you have to do. But it might be a framework for you to work off of. Um, and so, again, the, 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 um, the downtown clinic, um, I've got in my head three different projects, and I, I don't really care where it goes, and I kind of hope that you guys really have a drive and a passion, or the three that end up in that group are like, this is what we're doing. And again, it might be something totally different, but, but in talking to um, Anne-Marie the couple times that we did, and watching the, the presentation again, and just hearing you guys' thoughts thus far this semester, because we started with two, and now there's a third rolling around in there. Um, so I'm going to talk about acres very quickly, because that one is, I would say, much more clearly defined, because it's a follow-up experiment, and we have some infrastructure in place that we need to use. Um, so for acres, and I, I really, really, really like that you guys have brought up the idea of modifying the carbon content. At the end of last year, Rachel and I tried to push it hard. didn't happen. Um, and so I think that if we have some data that says, you need to do this, that, that it'll be kind of more powerful. And then at that point, if, if it is what needs to be done and they don't change it, that we can say, you know, like, if we're going to be a partnership, <laughs> there needs to be two ways here. Or, you know, that, that they can then talk to the college about why they aren't going to change it. So acres. Um, we're going to have six piles, I think, is what we're going to have to have to have the variables that we need. Um, and so, if, again, if you haven't been out there, the hoop house is ridiculously large. I think we could probably fit six full-size piles in there. Not going to do it because they've got five full-size piles total on hand. Um, but we're going to do half to two-thirds size. So the, the piles will be something like three to four foot piles. Um, and usually they have six, six footers, so we'll we'll end up with fairly substantial piles that we should be able to get like legitimate composting in is is the goal. Okay, so you guys have been writing this. What are our six piles going to be? Control. Okay, so there's a control. So it's five. Now there's five left. Okay, so we can't use finished compost. We're going to use tarp skin. But, but it'll be covered. OK. Control. Covered. Moisture. Moisture is something that we're going to get yeah. through the process yeah. itself. And the covering will bring that. OK. Aeration. Aeration. Modified, modified carbon. carbon. These, normal carbon. These, modified carbon. So we've got control, aerated. aerated and covered. And then each of these three piles with straw and then other whatever we decide to do brown matter. Newspaper, Newspaper cardboard, whatever we've got. We've got boatloads of cardboard. And it's C to N ratios off the charts. If you guys look at the table, it's twice as much as newspaper. 
no, I think we should, we, should, we should do it as we feel like it needs to be done. Because I think you can get mulched cardboard. And, and if not, like if we're taking away their need to have a tractor, it's not unreasonable to have something mulched. Um, I think that that's very doable. And I think that we actually looked last year at the end, and, and I think that the recycling service mulches the cardboard that they get before it goes out. Um, and they could just get it from there in that. But we might be able to do the same with newspaper. And so it might be easier for us to find newspaper because the issue with cardboard is the glue and the tape and stuff like that that's on there. And we don't have that with newspaper. Um, so I don't really care what the brown matter is. I think either of those is very easily accessible, has a much, much, much higher C to N ratio. So starting carbon content that we're getting with the straw. And I think should give us compelling results. And frankly, is going to hold a hell of a lot more moisture than straw. You know, so I, I think that we're going to get a lot of good things out of that. So those are our six piles. So we've got the three that we had last year, but bigger, and then we'll have the three. And again, the aerated is going to be like super duper awesome aerated because we're going to have negative pressure built in there that we should be legitimately pulling air through, um, which is pretty excited. So again, we're going to have perforated PVC with solar fans on them um, that ideally we can, when we're done, say, and these are your solar fans now. Please do this and use them. Um, and they were cheap. They were like 30 bucks. So it's the kind of thing that they could buy more of if they needed to. Um, OK, so from there, it's kind of up to you. What you want to characterize, how you want to identify whether or not we're actually getting this. Um, you know, if you guys read last year, you saw that we cored and we tried to look at different zones as we went through. You know, because if you've got a pile, with nothing in it, anaerobic, right? But you're gonna still have your kind of aerobic zone around, but we should hopefully start to see anaerobicity there and then catch it there. But if we have a pile and it's aerated with our perforated PVC, and I realize those would be dots, you know, if we're pulling a core, we might have anaerob or aerobic there and aerobic there, but we want to make sure that we have it there too, right? Which is why we did the striated sampling. And that's not to say that you have to, but you know, like if you don't, I would probably ask, how do you know the whole thing's actually aerated? You know, so think about those questions that you're going to get and saying, yeah, this is way better. It's going to do the thing. And you know, maybe it's not a big deal if we have an anaerobic zone in here. But if you're then going to flip it, those things are going to come out. But maybe it reduces the odor significantly, and we don't have to worry about it. Totally up to you. How you sample, what you look for, um, the kinds of variables that you want to identify are on you. Um, last year, we looked at ammonia and nitrate and everything, and we used little um, fish tank kits. Um, they're not super cheap. <laughs> you know, like we, we ended up spending a lot of money on them. I think that they were like 20 bucks a pop for something like 20 20 or 25 strips. But again, when you're doing six piles at three depths a day, that's 20 bucks every sampling day. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. like the dipsticks for the, fi yeah. So we use those. But it gave us effective data to over time say, hey, our nitrogen starting to, uh, it dropped out. And then it ended up correlating to when the piles dried out that like everything turned to crap on us. But we had a lot of data to tie together to say, this is when everything turned to crap on us. Um, which sometimes are good conclusions, right? It allows us to this year say, we're going to pay attention to moisture. Something that I would highly recommend that you monitor is moisture content, which is really easy to do because we've got fume hoods. You get um, some of the compost, weigh it right away, dry it out, weigh it after that. Fraction is your moisture content. Um, OK, so that's acres. I'm going to talk about the other one because there are more options. Again, how and what you sample, what you want to look for, and how you identify this is really up to you. Um, because you have six test piles, um, I would probably recommend planning on sampling once a week. Um, depending on what you're going to do and what you're going to look at, it might take you a whole day, and it might be a whole two-hour day to get whatever samples you need to have. And then it may take you legitimately the other three days to process all of it and get counts and enumerate. So um, as you think about this in terms of where are we going to build our PLFAs, where are we going to build our carbon-nitrogen ratios, what's our graph going to look like as we look at this over time, think that you're probably going to have 
eight time points tops. Okay, so the downtown clinic is somewhat exciting yet terrifying. Because again, I don't like to go into a lot of this without a great idea of what we're doing. Especially since like right now I'm trying to order things and I'm like, mm. <laughs> what was that back ordered? Um, let me do it. Okay, so with, uh, with the probiotic again, we know that there's um, it's the lactobacillus and the bifidobacterium in there. And we're able to grow and differentiate them both on our MRSBPP that we use in house. So um, talking about this initially, you know, our, our thought was, um, should we be trying to convince individuals to utilize the probiotic and or the providers to prescribe the probiotic? Or do we want the individuals taking it to get the most effect out of it? Um, and so that, that was where we initially started. But then in talking here, the third idea of they're not going to go back and get it again. So none of this really matters. So how do we actually increase access and make this usable um, came up as well. And so these are the kind of the three frameworks of, of projects that um, you know I at least have rolling around in my head on the downtown clinic and working with the probiotic. Um, so one, probiotic versus Clostridium difficile. Oh geez, D I F F I C. I just forget if there are two Fs. There might be one. When you type it into the PubMed, it might correct you. I think it's just one. Here, look, I'll half erase it, and then everybody's right. Um, so <laughs> probiotic versus Clostridium difficile. And so this is what Josh was just kind of talking about. Um, so if we're going to do this, this is the kind of convincing you to take it. Why might you take this, or what are you going to get out of it? So we can have one bacterium, the other, both together. And we can do standard, like, quick and easy plate assays where you're seeing zones of inhibition and things like that against the Clostridium difficile. Very easy to do. Difficile is anaerobic, so it does add to your cost, but um, these will also grow anaerobic, so it'll work okay. Um, it might be more legitimately close to what you would actually have in your gut, which is mostly anaerobic um, when you have it. Why, so, why, why did you jump to yeah. To difficile? Because difficile is what causes antibiotic-associated diarrhea. So, and, and on that, again, with, with a six-week time frame, it would be difficult to try to isolate other diarrhea causers or things like that or things that might be causing um, inflammatory bowel disorders or, or whatever. But, yeah, C, C. diff is, is antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Um, and so it'll be easy to find a lot of literature and a lot of justification. And if you say to a patient, oh, yeah, hey, this causes diarrhea when you have an antibiotic, which is why we, you should take the probiotic, um, it's not a hard jump. You know, there's so much literature that's like, there's diarrhea when you get antibiotic. Um, so a couple ideas that I had here um, with this one. One is just the straight up zone of inhibition kind of stuff on the plate one next to one another. You, you see what's happening and, and the results. Um, we could also, and I, I don't know 100% that this would work, but do a binding assay, um, which I think would be really cool, but might be like really low um, success rate. Um, where we could do, um, I could get um, sausage casings that are like pig intestines, and then we could have um, an anaerobic liquid culture where we've got um, one probiotic, the other probiotic, both, and then none, and then um, put C. diff in all of them, and, and we can then at the end take the casing out, rinse it off, and then enumerate the C. diff that's in the casing that basically demonstrates. Um, that the probiotic takes up those active binding sites, keeps C. diff from binding, which I think would be really cool. And again, might be 
good and useful data, especially if you think like in the end that we're hanging this poster in the downtown clinic and we're like, hey, this diarrhea causer can't bind if you're taking this probiotic that might get some patients across the bridge to say, hey, can I have that probiotic? I'm tired of having constant diarrhea. Or that might have some of the providers prescribe it more often. Um, so again, this is the talk people into taking the probiotic approach. Two, if you are taking the probiotic, how do you get the most out of it? Um, and so this is our, what do we call this, prebiotic? So we'll say prebiotic efficacy of the probiotic. Yeah, and so, so this one is, for those of you taking it, how can you optimize it? Or even more so, how might your diet affect your, everything else in your life, <laughs> you know, your microbiome? Um, and so here, I think that, um, you know, the, the way that I looked at this is that basically we would just make a bunch of custom media. So we've got our MRSBPB that we know that we start with, and then we could add different prebiotic factors to it. You know, so we could um, add a bunch of sugar, a bunch of fat, a bunch of protein. We can have mixes, some of the things that we might get out of, um, you know, vegetables and fruits that are more nutrients or out of the pickled, um, uh, like watermelon rinds that are supposed to be really effective at driving some of this, um, that we could basically characterize how the dietary input or even the breakdown products of it where it hits your gut, you know, because we can find you eat a bunch of fat, what's actually going to hit your gut. And that's the kind of stuff, again, that is very much in our wheelhouse. We've got those things and can get those things in the lab to make a lot of media um, that we could very broadly, you know, I mean, like we're not going to be able to in six weeks be very meticulously detailed and say, now when you eat this kind of fat as compared to this kind of fat, here's but we could look at diets in general and, and mixes to, you know, what's going to allow the probiotic to be the most successful. And with that, we may even be able to mix in some of our standard enterobacter ACA or other gut bacteria um, to have kind of a more complex picture. But that might be the dreaming big part of that. No, it's a great question. You know, and, and on that again, you know, some of this might just be better education purposes that we say when you have a choice, this is the way you're going to go or, you know, like try to deliberately seek out these kinds of things as opposed to those if you can or that for some of our providers that they might be able to get education from that and say, boy, as we're, you know, providing these kinds of things, maybe we should stress more of a sweet potato as compared to, a, you know, the other option that we have. So in conjunction? No, no, I, I agree. But, but maybe those resources are providable. Maybe, maybe you can go to this place and mm -hmm. get the cheap potato. I don't you know, and, and something that I think is important to keep in mind is that in six weeks, we're not going to solve oh, this okay, problem. Sure. But we can, we can add to the conversation and do our, our best due diligence to say we are trying to help and here's what we came away with. So even if it's two pieces of information that you can glean on that says, oh yeah, hey, I'm going to look to add this to my diet. Or, you know, well, I'm, I'm on this probiotic anyway. Maybe, you know, if I'm going to go get a quick and easy food here or something like that, if it's cheap, I can deliberately eat a little bit more instead of just getting what's there. Yeah, but, but again, <laughs> we're not going to solve social justice and, and food equality with a six-week microbiology project. I, I mean, like, I wish that we could. 
And again, it's important to dream big, right? Especially as we're talking about significance and objectives and things like that. You need to make your reviewer and your reader care about the problem. You need to reach a broad audience. But then at the same time, I think that as you narrow this down to objectives and how you're going to address this, that you have to be grounded to what you can do in the project. And with that, we've got seven minutes. Yeah, and, and please, by all means, like keep talking to us about this. Yes. Um, but, but we do have seven minutes, so I want to get the third one up here. Um, so the third one came out of the idea when we were talking to Anne-Marie of people getting the probiotic but then not going back for it and how we might be able to increase accessibility. And Josh brought up the idea of, of having a yogurt or something like that where it can be food um, but could also serve the purpose. And so um, I think that that would be interesting to try. Um, so the two bacteria in the probiotic are not your typical yogurt producers. Um, so if we're going to do this, um, I think that we could, um, I'm going to say probiotic effect on yogurt production. Um, and this is, you know, not a great way to write it up, but it, it'll work for a, a broad picture um, because also the yogurt production effect on the probiotic we would want to look at. But we could have a bunch of test batches of yogurt that we make in the lab. Um, you know, and, and I assume that when you do it at home, you do it in a crock pot or something like that. We could scrounge up some mini crock pots. Um, and yeah, and, and make this happen. So like with fairly little infrastructure, I think that we could do this and, and make it work. But um, if we're going to do this, we could make yogurt. And here our treatments would be a control, which is just normal yogurt with our strep thermophilus and our lactobacillus bulgaricus. And then we could do a yogurt with one of the probiotics or the other lactobacillus bifidobacterium and both of them together. Um, so that we can look at if it affects the production of the yogurt. And so things that we could look at there are pH, moderate activity, and stuff like that. Um, but also, we could quantify all the microorganisms involved. So we would look at both the uh, strep thermophilus and lactobacillus bulgaricus, but then also our two um, probiotic to see if while we're growing the yogurt, they're able to grow, and if we could actually make this a legitimate option that we could say then to the, you know, the soup kitchen or whatever, Hey, if this is the kind of thing that you want to have, we have some infrastructure. I talked to our funders. They have no problem with us buying stable equipment like crock pots if we have the intent of donating it at the end to the community partners that may be able to be helped. Um, or even that they at the downtown clinic could have yogurt there you, you know, once a week or whatever. You know, I mean, those are, those are details to sort out. Um, but you know, so that's the third one that, that kind of came from the talk and thought in here of if there's a way for us to actually make this something of more value than just medicine. You know, so you can go get food, but while you're getting food, get medicine um, to, to look at solving it. And so um, you know, something that may be an issue here for us is like delineating between, say, one lactobacillus and the other and things like that that, that might add some complexity. But that comes down to your literature searches and what you can find. There, there are ways always to differentiate. They might be hard. Um, but they do exist. So, but those are kind of our three ideas on the downtown clinic. And like I said, um, y you know, we, we really don't have a clear direction yet. And so, you know, hopefully those of you guys that are intending to work on that project or as you're putting together objectives, you might start coming and saying, oh, well, it's awesome. Two is just not practical. Or, you know, three is what I want to do, you know, and so I'm going to look at method. Or, you know, that, that you'll start to, to hammer out details. Um, 
just wondering how many people actually have perspective on, on the third issue in terms of people utilizing community, community uh, services such as um, you know, like interface and, and uh, soup kitchen. Does everybody know what that's about? Like personally, have you ever been there? I'm sure you yeah. have. So my, my friend, my friend Gary, um, he was homeless for Quite a while. I was still here. I was homeless and stuff. I was wondering if it'd be okay if you would be interested. Um, inside perspective. Inside perspective because he, he literally lived out of the tent. And, yeah. Uh, um, it, it was really sad. And, and I can tell you right now that he couldn't have yogurt where he was at because he couldn't hold it. He was, you know, he would stay. Um, and so he utilized, you know, Salvation Army. He used the soup kitchen. He used quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that would give a more real perspective on the social uh, hanging. I just feel like the yogurt might be a stretch. Yeah. That's all. Um, I think right, so we're not diverse. Yeah, I don't and I think that's important to remember that, you know, there are many people who are socially economically disadvantaged and not everyone it has the same exact ex contextual situation. So remember that again we are not into the conversation. Um, a good example is, say, a mother who's, who's a single mother and is raising two children, but one thing she has is a house, right? And, and she's got her house, right? So making yogurt and planting a garden actually are things accessible to her, right? And actually those are, are dirt cheap. I mean, I didn't mean to pun there, but they are, right? Um, and so those are, uh, we can't, we should look at demographics, but we can't assume one represents all. Yeah. Well, and, and on and that, so, you know, in, in that situation, you, you know, I don't I don't think this is practical for everybody in their house, but it might be practical for Interfaith or the soup kitchen to do it. You know, and then that way there there becomes availability. If this is the kind of thing that you could go to the downtown clinic and get once, but you don't want to go every week, but, sure. you know, you're going to go to the soup kitchen. And so, again, we might be able to, you know, educate them or have the downtown clinic educate them on ways that these kinds of things could become more readily available. And, you know, so I, th I think that that's, you know, at least the mindset that I have approaching it where I could see it doing the most good, where we could get these other entities that are already in existence better resources or better support or better education to, to really do the most good. But at the same time, you might have somebody who can do this in their, their home that, that then also benefits. So that's, that's where I see three being, being practical. It's not that every person can do it. Because like Amory said, some of them are living out of their cars. You know? I'm like, you're not going to have the ability to do that there. But you know, if, if you're going to use the resources that, that are already established and we can help those in some way, then it might allow us to hit a larger portion of the demographic that we're looking at. Yeah, and if you guys have thoughts on any of this, or you're saying, hey, I wonder if we can do this technique, shoot that stuff my way. I'm, I'm pretty happy to flush out whether or not something seems like we can handle it. Because, you know, this, I, I, I may have forgot something this morning. It's not a big lab, but it's possible to overlook that one other piece of equipment that might be there. <laughs> Monday afternoons and or Fridays for you guys. Are there, is there any freedom on those days? Yeah, Fridays. Monday, Wednesday are all day Adventist class from two to four and we have an eight six class. So it's kind of a long So like an early afternoon, Almost maybe. Like a, yeah. uh, like That's exactly what you want for lunch. <laughs> Heavy vomit smell everywhere. I, I can't get it on Mondays at all. Okay. I back to back, and then I have uh, lab meetings. Okay. We might set like two different times where it's like, okay, we'll go out and try to like. Because we've got to weed it and stuff like that and then too. We'll go yeah. And see if we can shovel some pebbles, you know. Yeah. We might even be able to catch like a Friday Monday or something. Yeah, exactly. Okay. 
Oh, that would be awesome. Do they have it right now? <laughs> Even during the winter, that would that would be awesome. Yeah, but we can at least look into it. Yeah. And then I don't even have to go. 